All right, the red light's on. Kevin will not have to hate me. So welcome, everyone, uh, to the last slot of the day. I'm here to talk about Project Browser. This is your technical deep dive. I realized very quickly that being able to do a technical deep dive in 45 minutes was not super easy to do. So I'll tell you, uh, in the interest, in in the uh, vein of all agencies, I have overpromised and underdelivered. I'll tell you already. <laughs> but I will get in. I'm going to touch on a lot of things in a lot of different areas around Project Browser. We're definitely doing some very cool stuff. And so my goal is that you'll walk out of here knowing at least what your starting point would be if you wanted to understand Project Browser, if you wanted to contribute to Project Browser or if you wanted to extend Project Browser. So that's my goal. Uh, who am I? My name is Chris Wells. Uh, I uh, co-own a company uh, in Portland, Maine. We operate out of Portland, Maine, uh, called Redfin Solutions. Um, probably a team of about 13 of us now or so. Um, very proud to say that we looked back on all of our contrib time over last year. Project Browser has obviously helped because myself and my co-initiative lead, Leslie Glynn, both work at, at Redfin. Uh, so it's been a hoot for us to do that. And we've uh, our 13-person company gave the equivalent of like a, a half-time person last year to these initiatives and others. So that was very cool. So I, yeah, co-initiative lead and I work over at Redfin Solutions. So what we'll cover today are a bunch of the different areas around Project Browser that people uh, that are kind of geeky geek out about. So we'll talk about the top level architecture, how this thing works from a very high level standpoint. We'll talk about the libraries, the progressively decoupled front end, uh, how we're handling routing services, hooks, uh, then some sub modules which we'll get into um, sort of the pluggable backends or the pluggable sources. And then I'll talk a little bit, if you were here at the last session, I'll talk about how we're then taking Package Manager and how we're integrating with it. So start with the top level architecture of how this works. So it's a module. It's currently a module that lives in Contrib. And so what we've done is we obviously have the PHP side of the module, but something that's a little bit new that we're kind of pushing the envelope with is we're using a JavaScript framework to power the front end, to get a really kind of lightning fast experience on the front end with the browser. Things that people are kind of used to expecting in things like the App Store, the Chrome Web Store, or the Apple uh, App Store or uh, for iOS, or the Android Google Play Store. Um, those are kind of the models of simplicity that we're going for to a large extent. And so the way that uh, this works is PHP is largely talking to your backend sources, and these are implemented as plugins. So uh, we have a source for the Drupal.org library of modules. We also have a source where we've invented a bunch of Latin names for fake modules, and we use that for testing, but it is pluggable. And then uh, we are packaging up the front end in Svelte, currently using Rollup, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then we ship that package down to the browser. So the browser is only ever talking to your Drupal site. It's not talking to Drupal.org directly. Uh, we are talking to the Drupal site and then it's talking to Drupal.org or wherever your external sources are. And while we recognize that this may be somewhat inefficient from a network latency standpoint, it brings a lot of great power to us by centralizing those requests so that we can, for example, um, do module allow lists or, or deny lists for projects or alter what's coming from the back end or use multiple different back ends that go out to different places. Um, and it helps a lot with uh, course type stuff and, and those kinds of security issues for cross origin resource. Sharing? Well, I don't know what CORE stands for. I just know I hate it. Um, so let's talk about the front end. We'll start there. I realized pretty quickly one of the places where I overpromised and underdelivered is like really the Svelte side of this is kind of its own whole presentation. So I'll talk very briefly about uh, the front end and how that's working. We did choose Svelte. Um, one of the probably main reasons that we did that is because uh, of the way Svelte builds. 
Um, but I like it because of this, uh, that this is kind of how you would set up a, a variable in React, and this is how you kind of set up a reactive variable in Svelte. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this guy on TikTok, but he's, he's kind of uh, Captain Obvious is kind of his, his, his MO is like someone gives this like life hack about how to like rearrange your toilet paper and he's like, oh, you know what else you could do? Pull the toilet paper down and tear it off. <laughs> so this is kind of how I feel about Svelte. Um, I've used React. I, I, I feel like I've gotten to the end of React projects and still not know how I got it working. And it's, it's a lot simpler for me, I think for a lot of other people to understand Svelte. Um, but one of the other advantages of Svelte is f with React, we would have to ship React with core, for example. We'd have to um, decide on a, on a library version that's going to go with core, kind of like we did with jQuery. Um, with Svelte, when it bundles, it, it bundles, but it delivers vanilla JavaScript at the end of the day. So we're just shipping a regular vanilla JS file. So when we get into libraries, we'll talk about that. Um, so how does, in general, how does that work? Here's our entry point for our entire application. This is sort of int main if you're an old C person, or this is our top level component for the project browser. We kind of have two main screens in the entire project browser. The, the browsing screen where you're kind of shopping for modules, and then the equivalent is this module page, which is if you click to get details for a specific project and you want to read more about it. So this is really, this is the actual component here that powers the whole thing. So you can see some very nice things here uh, that are in Svelte is like you can just await a promise <laughs> and when the promise resolves, you have a then and you can just do what you need to do. Here, so it's actually pretty simple to understand um, that stuff. And so, as you can see, with like project browser, that's the component that's the main project browser, and module page is the second screen where you're looking at the detail for a particular project. So those are components that are nested under this app.svelte component, and it just is components all the way down. So. If you've worked with uh, React or any other of these front-end JavaScript frameworks, Svelte is actually a little bit more similar to Vue in terms of how its components are organized. The scope CSS, the JavaScript, and the markup all live in one file. Um, so it just ends up being smaller and smaller components that can do things. So the build process, Svelte likes to uh, build using Rollup. Uh, but we're actually just starting to look at converting that process to Webpack since that's what Drupal Core uses. And as we are, our main goal is to get this into Drupal Core. Um, ben Mullins, I think, is, is looking at that and he is a super smart dude. So I trust that he'll be able to uh, dig into that. Um, we have made some changes to the default roll-up build process, and these will be some of our hiccups as we roll into Webpack is how to do these same things. So we did some changes that would allow, for example, Drupal.t calls to exist and not be processed by Svelte so that those uh, multilingual calls will work when we're doing translation of JavaScript interfaces and stuff. Um, so there's just a little bit of work you have to do to sort of exclude certain things from being built in the Svelte way. Um, similarly, we've had to tell the compiler to ignore certain settings um, or certain warnings that are coming up because we're including like Drupal settings from the global scope, things like that. Uh, one weird bug that we found, which maybe would be something we don't have to fix in Webpack, is that the order of the CSS being compiled was non-deterministic in Svelte. I think it was just whatever one came back first, it threw that CSS in there, uh, which definitely caused um, not necessarily issues with how it works because it's scoped, like styled component stuff anyway, but it really messed up our diffs, uh, especially... Eventually, we figured out how to just, with git attributes, ignore the compiled JS when we're doing code reviews, but it was telling us things were different that, that shouldn't have been different, even if we didn't change any CSS. So we were able to make that a, a little bit more deterministic over and over. So we'll see as we convert over to Webpack, we want to know 
how we can get this closer and closer to Drupal core's build process, um, as that is ultimately our goal. So like I said, because we're compiling, the Svelte processor just compiles to vanilla JavaScript, we can just include libraries the same that we would with anything else without any additional dependencies. We don't need to load a React library. We don't need to load a svelte.js. We just load our bundled uh, JS and our bundled CSS. We've also added some support uh, for 7 and Clara just to make sure that the project browser looks good in both of those uh, core themes. And then another very cool thing, um, I think with some work that Ben did with the processor to ignore this stuff, we can use core libraries to do things that there are other libraries, like there's probably a Svelte debounce and a, and a Svelte dialogue and a Svelte announce type of you know, equivalents, but we don't need or want to use those. We want to use Drupal's. They're already there and they're already the UI that, that we have. So we were able to finagle it so that we can pull in these additional dependencies and use them from within the Svelte application. And that's pretty huge, in my opinion, because we didn't want to go without this. I remember trying to code like an alert dialogue, and I was like, why am I doing this? Like, can I use a modal that we have in core? And we, we ultimately figured that out. I keep saying we. This was like Ben Mullins. I am really the sort of product owner here. but. <laughs> um, and then the only other library that we have is we just pull in the table drag library uh, so that we, because we actually have a nothing to do with Svelte admin backend where you can configure your sources for where you're pulling projects from and you can order, order them and enable and disable them. So we just have regular old table drag there just for admin settings UI. And that's all our library. Uh, there we go. Oh, and here it is. <laughs> so two of these are enabled, and you can move them up and down, and all the normal stuff that you would expect. Okay. So the routing, this is um, not tricky, but this, this explains these are the endpoints that we're really dealing with in terms of fetching data. It's ultimately very simple. There's kind of two endpoints. So we go through, uh, this is still named Drupal Org Proxy from, from way back in the day. We've never gone back to kind of remove that idea. But the idea is this is the endpoint that the Svelte front end is calling out to uh, on the Drupal side, which is then querying all your backends for projects, or I keep saying backends, I really should say sources, for your projects. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So that gets all the projects. It's a you know paginated query, hey, go fetch me the next 24 projects or whatever it is. And then there's the endpoint to fetch the categories that you want to filter those by. So actually, let me show you quickly the, um, oh wait, I'm on extra monitor, so I gotta go to the right and then up here. So just so that you're looking at something a little bit more visual, uh, the categories are, are here down the left-hand side. I have two sources enabled for Project Browser, the mocked Drupal.org, so all your regular contrib stuff, and then Drupal Core. We actually have a, a source for stuff that ships with Drupal Core that you might want to turn on from this page. You can see that automated cron is already on, but if you wanted to install the activity tracker, you could do it. You'll notice that the categories are different between the ones that are coming from Drupal core and the ones from uh, contrib. And we're doing, um, there has been much outcry from the Drupal community to see what it would be like to try and coalesce those into two, uh, into one list. Um, and we have been doing a lot of work uh, to get a new set of categories for contrib. So we're getting that down from 55 to about 19. Um, and we definitely need uh, people to, to look at and review those categories. But So would this eventually, would you not have the list tab eventually since you have the core stuff available here? That's a dream of mine. And I think that there's not been anyone who I've said, like, should we do this, that yeah. said no. So I think ultimately that's where we're headed. I don't think it's MVP, but I definitely think it's, it's where we're headed, that this could just be the install. Uh, play. You know, what we don't have, for example, now is the ability to uninstall from Project Browser. So, you're, you know, there are still some needs right now to be on the list page, but ultimately 
that's kind of a dream, I think. Yeah. If, yeah. if you search for a module that happens to be a core, will it find it, or do you have to yeah, it will tell you that uh, such a thing exists on the other side. So um, I don't know, I'll do access. You can see that there's nothing in core for access, but it did take me down from like 3,000 here. So it will keep you where you are, um, assuming you want to search that, but it will update uh, across the other source to, to let you know that there's something over there in case it's not over here. The goal with these pluggable backends is that ultimately you could have a third tab here or maybe you don't care about Drupal core with your own your organization's custom modules, right? Or the Acquia specific stuff or someday I hope that this will expand into being a recipe browser and you know like Redfin we we're already using recipes um, so it'd be really great to just look through all the Redfin recipes and say, turn on our events recipe, or whatever it is. So, um, Yeah, so categories and the API calls, that's where I was. Um, we have other routing, the routing that comes straight from, so this were, these were the API calls and endpoints. These are for the actual browser. So this is the endpoint for the actual browser, which is admin modules, browse, and then sort of optionally a module name. And then the project browser settings page, which I showed here. This is kind of the settings page. So that's a more just traditional settings for project browser. And then we have some dynamic routes that we're using uh, a route callback for, and those all have to do with package manager integration. So we have routes that are for Ajax calls so that we can update you as we install a module to tell you at what stage of package manager we're, we're at right now to kind of walk you through the process. So if you were to actually install a, no, uh, over here, if you were to install one of these bad boys. I have no idea if this is going to work because I have messed with this repo a little bit. Um, but you can see down here it's requiring the module and that might change eventually depending on how fast this wants to work to something else. So we have some endpoints where we can kind of communicate back and forth the status of what's happening. So now we're applying which I think is bringing it back onto this website. And then this is actually installing the module for you as well, so it will uh, enable the module that... <laughs> uh, yeah, so now I, I have literally no idea what Access Filter does, but it's now installed on my, on my local site. Um, and like I said, now, now you just get a checkbox and no button, because you can't uninstall it. You're, you're back into Composer land if you actually want to remove this and, and uninstall it. But, um, did it update your composer? Yes, it did. Absolutely. It updated my composer. Uh, JSON and lock, package manager did all that for me, copied it back to the, this live site, which for me is, of course, a local DDEV site. But uh, now I could go into my terminal and do a get status, and I would see that my composer JSON and composer lock have changed, and I could commit those and ship them through CI. Or if this was actually a live site, it would have just happened, and I'd be good to go. Um, good there. I forget why I brought this up. Something about oh the dynamic routes. Yeah, so that's uh, communicating the status of what's going on when you do want to install a module, um, which you can run package manager without the automated install functionality. And when you click the button there, the button instead of add and install becomes view commands. And it gives you a little modal with the composer commands that you need to run. So that's kind of a fallback scenario where project browser is still very useful for shopping for a module and then can still help you get the module installed uh, in the more traditional means uh, if you want to. Services. So we are using a handful of services from Core. So uh, we're extending the logger and cache and a temp store, which we're just using for various, you know, loggers and caches you kind of need always. Uh, I'm not as familiar with temp stores, and I don't exactly know why we're using them. Uh, so if you have a question about that, you can ask Tim, maybe. <laughs> I like to give presentations where I have to uh, learn the thing that I'm going to present. I use them, and, and sometimes that bites me, but here we are. 
So our services, these are the ones that are really ones that we have invented and are bringing here, are the Project Browser Source Manager. So that's really the uh, plugin system manager for the different sources that you can use. So if you want to write your own custom source for your organization's private GitHub and all your modules that are private to you, Source Manager is the plugin manager for that. All you really need to do to extend it is write a plugin. Uh, then there's the enabled source handler. So that's if, if the one of the sources is enabled, it gets some special treatment. And then we have two validators. Um, we're calling them validators. They're really event subscribers to the lifecycle of package manager. And I'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. So those are kind of our services. And then there's a couple of our services that are temporary. So one thing that is important to know, I'm going to back you all the way up to this uh, diagram here. These sources over here, like I said, there's the Drupal.org source for all of our contrib projects, and there's the core source, which is disabled by default, but I enabled on the demo. Or, you know, the third one could be one you write yourself for a GitHub or to pull your allowed projects from a Google Sheets, whatever you want it to be. Um, right now, the Drupal.org API, Drupal.org is a Drupal 7 site, and it's using sort of a custom REST WS, if I understand correctly, API. It's not the API that we want to use. So as a lot of this work that's been going on behind the scenes, we have actually upgraded, uh, we have a Drupal 9 site stood up in development uh, that we are migrating the package info into every night. So all the release info, all of the uh, project info, all of that stuff. And we are waiting for the association who is targeting the end of March. So we're very close to this, I think. Getting a production version of that Drupal 9 site stood up. So for now, what we're doing to provide contrib information is we're actually generating a gigantic JSON fixture and we're loading that onto your Drupal site with all of your all the contrib project information. So the source that we are currently using, if you, if you had a very keen eye, you will see that it's actually drupal.org parentheses mocked. So about every month I go in and run a drush command that actually generates a fixture. So the data that you're seeing inside of Project Browser is from a fixture that was generated at a point in time. This is not actually like necessarily live data. For example, the fact that this has 274 installs is from like March 3rd. That number could be wrong now. So once we have a production endpoint stood up, we'll be switching the mock API over to the real API. That work's already been done. It's already tested against the development server. So we're very close on that. We're really just waiting for kind of a production server to be able to uh, get to that point. So these, fixed, or these temporary services that I was talking about are really related to generating that fixture. It's that drush command and uh, a subscriber, I don't know what we were even using the subscriber for, but that's the, the main point is that there's this temporary idea of how we've mocked up using the API until we could get a live Drupal 9 API, because the API is totally different than the one we're using in Drupal 7. Okay. Hooks is easy, there's only two hooks we're using and one of them is hook help. Can anyone know what's happening here? Is that American Sign Language for help. Help. And it's directional, so help me, or I can help you. All right. And then over here, hook theme is just to give the, like a lot of these JavaScript front ends, you give it one empty div and you mount a ton of uh, DOM into that empty div. So this is really, this is our empty div, this is our theme template. And we have a little initial loading until we actually get the. Um, DOM kind of loaded in. So that's why it's a little bit bigger than just your traditional single empty div. But that's the only thing we're using hook theme for. You only have one template and it's right here. So all, all the other stuff, all the other markup you're seeing is all on the Svelte side. 
And then submodules. So the submodules that we are shipping with, there's a couple uh, baked in there. And it is Project Browser Devel, and that's just another plugin and backend that we use for testing. And it generates uh, incredibly dumb Latin text data. It, it looks as if Devel Generate made a bunch of projects for Drupal. Um, and then the project browser source example, we got written up, I think, in Prague. So Fran Garland from the association has been immensely helpful to our initiative, and I was able to meet up with him in Prague. And that's one of the things we did was we wrote a source example. So turning it on is pretty useless. I don't know what it shows you or even if it works. I think it, it would actually work. Um, but that will actually show you if you did want to write your own source plugin, it gives you, it walks you through, it's like a very well commented plugin class where you could copy and paste it, change the names, and then there's really only two methods in our entire interface. Get projects, which returns an array of uh, project browser project, and then get categories, which returns a more simple structured array of all the categories that are relevant to your source. And that's all you really need to do, and all the magic is really up to you of like, am I fetching the available project information from Google Sheets, or from XML, or from a GitHub repo over the GitHub API, or what am I doing to, to get that stuff? But all that Project Browser really needs is information about projects and information about categories. Um, now, of course, we can do a lot of filtering and that sort of thing, and that is mostly on the project data itself. Like, is this project secured? Uh, like, uh, covered by security release? Is it maintain actively maintained? All that stuff that you're used to seeing on Drupal.org. And then, why did I link to this issue? I don't know, I'm just gonna open it. and see what the issue is. Either that or I duplicated a slide from before, but. This is, ah, yes, so currently, um, one thing that we cannot do that is kind of hard-coded is that when we are asking for a package, we are hard-coding the Drupal slash namespace in front of it. So we do need this issue to land before we could actually, like, compose or require Redfin slash Marina or something like that. So that is the current limitation of, of where we're at with that. But um, for MVP, we're really targeting can we get contrib uh, stuff in. But that's definitely a great opportunity to contribute if anyone's coming tomorrow. Um, and finally, our package manager integration. So everything that I've talked about thus far would all work, would all be relevant, even if you did not turn on the package manager integration and you just wanted to view commands and run the composer commands yourself or the drush commands yourself or whatever it is you wanted to do. So if you were not here last time, the very quick overview is that there's a package manager has a life cycle. And when you tell package manager, I want you to install some new package or update a package or whatever it is you need to do, it creates a staging area copy of your site, then it does the composer commands during the require phase, then it applies them by putting them back on your site, and then it destroys the temporary staging environment at the time. So how we are interacting with this, this all happens in our installer controller. If you read the wonderful documentation that is in uh, Package Manager about how to use it, you'll see that you need to extend their stage class. And we are not doing that in installer controller. I just want to point that out. Um, our installer controller is where most of our logic is. And then we have a very simple, very simple extension of stage. So most of our integration with Package Manager is actually very light. Package Manager is doing a ton of the heavy lifting for us. Um, a lot of it is just really around the things that are specific to us. Um, so our installer controller, then we have an apply, a require. I put apply twice for some reason. That should have been create. So 
We have a create method on here, require, apply. We have a post apply method, so that's when we actually are, if you were here last time, package manager at each of these stages fires off a pre-event and a post event for each stage that you can react to to do certain things. So that's where we're handling like post apply. Um, so this is a controller, it does not extend stage. That is the installer.php, so that's what I mentioned at the top of the slide. And why are we doing this? The two big reasons that we're doing this is we've had additional, we are calling them validators, but they're really event subscribers, where we can say, um, package manager allows us to throw an error. Um, you saw pretty much this exact thing last hour if you were here. Um, there's a pre-require event coming in. This is an event subscriber and you can just add an error. So we are doing this uh, for one reason. Um, the package you asked for hasn't already been installed. So the one thing that's really wild about this is we're taking what is traditionally a very single user flow, which is I'm a developer, I'm working on my development environment, there's no other users using my development environment, it's just me, so I know when I can safely run composer commands. And we're really bringing this into like a multi-user world where two people could be using Project Browser at the same time on two different browsers and one could have asked to install Path Auto 60 seconds ago and now I might be asking to install Path Auto. So we want to make sure that something hasn't already been installed um, that you've just asked for. You might also go away for an hour and someone has installed it or you installed it from your phone or something and you come back to your previous uh, page that you haven't reloaded and it doesn't show you that it's installed. So we're having to protect against this sort of multi-user world in a way that we didn't have to when developers are sitting at their own machines using command line composer. Uh, and yes, sir? That's what TypeScore is for. Wonderful. What do you mean? That's how it, it keeps the different users separate, gives you some temporary things, keeps it there for you to come back to. Ah. Temporary. There you go. Store. I figured it was some sort of temporary storage, but I just didn't know why we were using it. So it's a lot to do with these validators. Uh, bought things, but only temporarily. Yeah, and then you can bring them back. It's like a pawn shop. It's why we didn't call it pawn shop. Ugh. <laughs> and then, uh, let's see, is this the one I already did? So this is package you asked for. So we have a second um, validator that we're also using, which is during pre-apply that the request did not cause Drupal core to be upgraded. So in the pre-require, we might remember this is an earlier stage. So we've copied our code over. We want to make sure that the code we copied over doesn't already have the module we need. This happens actually, this other one happens pre-apply. So right before we copy it back, this is the only time we have an opportunity to look and say, hey, did this update Drupal core? because that might be something that our users are not going to expect. It might be something that users using automatic updates might expect. I don't know, you're not, you are, you are not preventing updates to Drupal core, correct? We're only doing updates to Drupal core. Yeah, right, exactly. So obviously this is not something that's, that's just one already built into Package Manager, yeah, touche. Um, but we don't want that to happen because we don't want our users to suddenly find themselves you know, like a major bump ahead. Oh, well, we managed to install Webform like you asked, but uh, it bumped you from, you know, 10.0 to 10.1. You might not be ready to do that upgrade. So we are, if that is going to happen, then what, is nobody moving? Or is it? It's actually very soon. I would like to do some laps, but nothing's, nothing's working. So. Sadly, we're... <laughs> We're almost done anyway. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's like the Oscar music. Yeah, it's pl is it playing me off? I've got 10 minutes. Uh, so that's it. So um, the top level architecture, like I said, we're, we're running through that sort of proxy in the, on your Drupal site from the front end and not querying back ends directly with JavaScript so that we can have more control over how that works. And now I'm getting a phone call, apparently, that I need to decline. And then uh, we talked about the libraries, which really 
we pull in table drag um, to do our own table drag stuff. We stole it from the block module largely, but the Svelte bundle is really one of those biggest things in that library. Uh, the front end is all svelte with components. Uh, cool opportunity to learn and much easier, in my opinion, to learn than React or even Vue. Um, routing, we have API endpoints that the front end calls, and we have a couple of other more traditional uh, routes as well, like our admin back end. Uh, we've got a bunch of services that are tied uh, Four that are that are pretty permanent. Two of which are composer validator or uh, package manager event subscribers validators, and then a couple of submodules which are really to help you understand how to build your own source um, backend. The hook that just provides uh, is a hook theme, so we can have our one tiny template with our empty div. And then we talked a little bit about how we're integrating with Package Manager, leaning on it very heavily, and just adding a couple of other constraints that are important to us that are not necessarily important to automatic updates or, or anything else. So, boom, I almost nailed it. Well, I'm supposed to go to a 4.15, right? Is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. All right, seven minutes for, for questions. I, I, I have never run this. I probably finished it last night. So I'm like really impressed with my timing. <laughs> Thank you. Other or any questions about this? Yes, sir. Uh, this is more of a spell question. Uh, when does rollup run? Does it run when you set when you do the when you install the module or when you release the module uh, or every request? Or? Good question. So uh, rollup is um, the question is when does rollup run? When does that happen? So Rollup is a JavaScript um, builder or processor. So if you've ever written SAS, every time you change the SAS, it is watching for file changes, it compiles the SAS into native CSS, and then that native CSS is what's actually loaded in the browser. So it's very similar there. So it really only runs while you're developing. You'll usually run it with a watcher. And as you make changes to your Svelte components, it'll recompile them into that native JavaScript. So you run it while you're developing, and then you run it during the build process. And it takes all the weird stuff that's in those Svelte components and turns it into native vanilla JavaScript. So it's, it's a build time tool. Yeah. Good. Other questions in the back? Is there any uh, <coughs> plan or roadmap for adding more metrics into the browser? Like you have header that's all installs, but one of the hard things is like, you know, how how many issues does this have open? Like, mm -hmm. are this actively maintained or not? And I can mm -hmm. envision maybe me rating it after I've installed it. Oh, I like this, rate it. Mm -hmm. Is there any plans for that? Or? Good, yeah. So the question is, what are the plans around enhancing the metrics and enhancing what's visible? Uh, to users for quality indicators is kind of what we've been referring to this as. So I can say that um, if I go back quickly, uh, I can figure out my rights from my lefts again. Um, we do have, uh, let me clear, let me just get back to the recommended filters here and get back to drupal.org and then erase this access thing. Okay. So Am I on page two or something? Oh, this has a parenthesis, so it's now showing up. Bert, no. Am I in access? I did something here that... Ah, there we go. We're tra traditionally sort by active installs. I have no idea at what point I hit that button, but here we are. So this is what I'm used to seeing. Um, so we do show whether or not it's covered by the security policy now. Whether or not it's uh, actively maintained, we show currently on the detail page. There is a pretty substantial uh, open issue. Uh, our site builder subcommittee, um, who is really around to represent people new to Drupal and people who might not understand that like number of open issues is a quality indicator, we're trying to get um, this detail page to be the most useful thing. Uh, that we can, and we actually do have a five-minute survey. Um, you can check my Mastodon or my Twitter. Both of them are Chris from Redfin. And we're trying to get uh, an idea from people, what are the most important quality indicators to you? Because we want to make sure that they're featured first when we're looking at this. Um, 
So I think a lot of those we have thought about, they are also um, things that are filtered by. So our recommended filters are that it must be actively maintained or minimally maintained, and it must be covered by the Drupal security policy. So when you load Project Browser, those are the only ones that you're going to see by default. You actually have to sort of opt into, I don't care if it's covered by a security policy or not. Um, and there's, there's a handful of those filters kind of down here. For ratings, it's something that we don't currently have and I think is definitely not MVP because you need to get that data. You need to collect ratings before you can show ratings. Um, but that's probably the one big feature that I think people have brought up over and over, and so I think that you know it's not on our it's not on our roadmap, but it is on our radar. I think to see if we could get you know that's something we'd need to get involved with the data on Drupal.org as well in order to really understand and be able to sort by rating. So and then you have like quality indicator plugins or something. It is not architected that way now, but um, another big issue we're working on is basically the themeability of this because that's very hard to do in Svelte. Um, you would, you would be compiling your own new Svelte app, really, and we were trying to avoid that. So we're looking at ways to make these Svelte components overridable in the traditional way that Drupal Twig templates are overridable. Once we can do that, then there's no reason why a contrib module couldn't uh, pull in an additional quality indicator and put it, on the, uh, put it in the component. So. Somebody could, though, replace the current plugin source with their own that like goes to Drupal or but then or Drupal then filters out everything that doesn't have their metrics of what they consider quality. Absolutely, yeah. So one thing that you could do if you were wanting to not have this, um, like a lot of higher ed institutions have their own sort of allow list of projects that are allowed to be installed. This is a great tool for them because they can just build all that into their own database. It's all scraped from Drupal.org. And if they want to then figure out how to do five-star ratings on their suite of 200 modules, they can do that, add that to their plugin. And then once this is the components are themable, they could even add that star rating onto the card or onto the list view. So yeah, for sure. Do you look at the release data at all? So like one of just think of one of the things I checked for when I'm thinking of installing a project. There are lots of modules out there that are actively maintained and plainly have security coverage but have no stable release. Mm -hmm. um, is those projects is get included in the results or is it not? Mm -hmm. Like a bit unit that's just like an alpha? Or? Yeah, so the question is um, how are we f filtering out or, or how do we? Oh, I don't even know how to rephrase your question, but I'm just going to answer it. I'm sorry to everyone on the recording. Maybe you heard just through my mic. I don't know. So um, what we do know is that our version of maintained is simply marked as actively maintained or minimally maintained. That is, that is pretty self-selecting. Our uh, recommended filter around covered by the security policy, the Drupal security policy, is no alphas or devs are covered. That you have to have a stable release in order to do so, that. So it does actually validate that stable release. Exists. Yes. Because like I've, I've dealt with security advisors for public for products that are like, yes, we have security coverage, except we've never created a release that actually supports it. So yes. <laughs> yes, sir. So that filter does not acknowledge your uh, release state at all. Okay. Our, that's that's our, what I want. Our fixture creator does. Ah, so that's why we've been seeing it so match in, that way. In the thing that we're using to generate the fixture of data, that actively reads the core compatibility, uses the sender, satisfies, checks, and makes sure it only has modules in the data set that are available, app, like applicable to your site. So, so I think I think this problem might be a big part of the platform. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying. So we have code that fixes what you're saying. But it's in our fixture vision. So, but there is also friends in the VA wrote this code into the endpoint. Okay. That's waiting for the so the endpoint will return. And so that's going to happen. Oh, okay. So we, 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 we will be doing the, we'll be doing the same thing that we're doing in the fixture in the D9 endpoint. And the good news is that makes the data set smaller. Yes. So we have less filtering to do on the front. Yeah, I was very surprised that it went 2,500, like a that's like only. Yes. Only. Yes, was, and that's. 3,600 when we're doing D9 development. And then we switched in the six seconds. That's not small. 
Yes, because we've been could, because we're generating a fixture at a point in time, and we're generate and we're only pulling in modules that are compatible with the version of Drupal that the fixture was generated on. Once we went to 10x only compatibility, our set got much smaller. Um, but the idea is you will be able to turn these filters off and then well, I mean, right be able now, to see it. There's nothing exposed for it at but, all. So. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not it's not metadata about the project. No, it's it's release information that something we have to interpret and provide the project. Out. Yes. I did have um, a couple of thoughts about the, the the earlier. So you mentioned in the presentation that um, by default, installing if, if a new module will not allow, be allowed to be added to the site if it would cause a core update due to the requirements. Um, we are going to be dealing with the same problems based on auto updates. There will probably eventually be a setting that allows the user to choose whether auto updates happen um, for security releases only, mm -hmm. for any bug fix release, um, or even allow minor updates to happen automatically for like the long tier. Mm -hmm. um, and major updates should theoretically be possible, but we're not going to expose that to the user interface, obviously. And I, I was thinking that, first of all, it might make sense for that to be at the same configuration option or to use the same paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, but also, like Ted mentioned, in a, a lot of times a random contrib module's patch release is, is a more disruptive update than a minor update of core. Um, so, 100%. Okay, so does this pay any attention to what other projects might already exist that are being updated when you can be installed? Uh, we are, if I understand right. you correctly, like we're doing, we're just doing what Composer tells us to do. Really, at the end right. of the day, we're saying, "Hey, go and update this," and we're leaving it up Composer. For example, Composer's uh, preferred stability. We're honoring that. Um, what we don't have that was actually a piece of UX feedback that we just got very recently. I think at MedCamp, or even more recently than that. No, Leslie in Florida, I think couple of weeks ago, it would be really nice to know when it's done, what version did you go from and to? And we're not showing you that information now, um, but I was going to file that as uh, part of our listening session so that you would at least know, hey, something broke, and by the way, it, it had to upgrade C tools from 431 to 436, just so you know that that happened, and then you can, that, that's more information to know if it did break your site, why. We could also choose to disallow that if we wanted to. Uh, yeah, right. I, I, for I, sure. I, I think it's worth uh, like it's worth considering at least. I mean, like yeah. so far, automatic updates has just avoided this problem by saying it's not in the MVP, but we are going to have to deal with it eventually. So okay. we should, but but they'll both be in core by that point, hopefully. So maybe we can deal with it at the same time. Yeah. I'm going to press the big red button. Okay. Thank you.